All right, well, there's already a lot of discussion just from putting up the title slide. Um, the abstract that I originally submitted was titled Building Web Apps with Grunt and Bauer in Visual Studio 2015. But if you've been following the news that came out of Build this week, um, Microsoft just released the release candidate for Visual Studio 2015. And in CTP6, the default uh, build agent in uh, ASP.NET 5 apps was Grunt. Now it is Gulp. <clears throat> so yeah, I, I changed a couple things um, in the slide. Um, we'll still talk about Gulp a little bit, but uh, our main focus is gonna be on Gulp. Um, so anyways, my name's Michael Baltic. Um, I'm a principal consultant with Cardinal Solutions. I've uh, been working in the Columbus area for 10 to 12 years now, um, and you'll see there my Twitter and uh, Instagram handle that you can go on there and look up. So in order to get the uh, ice broken and uh, my nerves out of the way, we'll just embarrass myself here real quick. Um, so who is Nerdstrap? So first of all, he's a crazy cat lady. Uh, I got two cats, uh, they like to play um, blackjack and other board games. Um, I like to take a lot of pictures of cats, um, but I for one welcome our fluffy, cute, and completely evil overlords. <clears throat> Next up, uh, I am a mustachioed American, if you couldn't tell from all the way there in the back row. Uh, a man without, the, this is a famous quote, a man without a mustache is like a cup of tea without sugar. Until I was old enough to grow a mustache, um, I never knew what I was missing. Um, all of my friends and family who knew me before I had one, though, wish I had never found it. Uh, Movember became popular um, about eight or nine years ago in the States, and I tried it a couple times. It was pretty, pretty sad. So uh, I finally was able to get it to stick after the third or fourth try, and now people are constantly asking me, okay, so how long are you going to keep it? Well, here's the answer. I'm going to wait until it's this big. <clears throat> um, the next thing is, I'm a window phone hipster, so all of, I mean, I've got Microsoft, I've got all the, all the, all the fun toys here. Um, as you'll see there in that picture is my Lumia 1020 here. It's got the bigger pixels for the cameras, and then I've also got this gigantic uh, phablet um, Nokia Lumia 1520, and I'm just waiting for that new one to come out whenever they decide to do it. <clears throat> Um, and then I'm a Buckeye, so I went to the Ohio State. OH! Thank you, there we go. This was at the, uh, I'm a true fan, so this is at the uh, Wisconsin game two years ago. Uh, my brother and I sat in the very top row, freezing cold, but it was a really cool experience to see snow blowing around in the shoe. Um, I recently just went to uh, Asia for fun, and uh, when I got to Korea, everybody gave me some weird stares, so for multiple reasons. Um, I finally, uh, asked somebody what was, what was the uh, issue with that everybody was staring at me, and he said, you look just like someone from our past. So they dressed me up in traditional <laughs> Korean garb. <clears throat> um, and I posted these uh, on Instagram, and immediately my cell phone bill went crazy from all of the people texting and messaging me. <clears throat> I only went over by like $30, though, so it was fine. Uh, but yeah, they, the guy who, who ran the uh, photo booth had quite a bit of fun, as well as I did. <laughs> I love this hat too. I was hoping that it had uh, some sort of metal edge so that I could be like Kung Lao or something from Mortal Kombat. Um, and then finally, if you have seen me walking around in these uh, bright pink shorts with elephants on them, I'm also a chubby spokesmodel. So this is from vacation last year. Is it coming up? And so I never thought I'd see, you know, my butt on the big screen, but there it is. <clears throat> All right, so I feel better. Hopefully you do too, or you're scared. <clears throat> All right, so the agenda here. We're gonna talk about uh, JavaScript first of all. So we're in the JavaScript track. Um, there's, got, there's a lot of development tasks that uh, have been talked about today already, but we're gonna specifically talk about distributing and building apps across all of the different platforms. Um, and how, does, how do we achieve that? So I'm gonna talk about Node, and then after that we'll, we'll touch on Bower, and then uh, talk about some build agents, and like I said, Grunt used to be in, now it's out. It's not really out, so Visual Studio still fully supports it, um, and there are still more uh, Grunt plugins than there are Gulp plugins, 
but the performance gains from, from Gulp is what made them go with uh, that as the standard. Um, then we're gonna talk about the, the full uh, software development life cycle and how Grunt, Gulp, Bower, and Node can enable an entire team to work together and um, use all of the same tools and interact um, no matter what platform you're on. But the reason we're really here is we're gonna talk about Visual Studio 2015. Um, you know, it's Microsoft's shiny new toy and they just released a, a bunch of new versions. They also just released versions for Mac OS and uh, Linux. Um, so we're gonna take your skills from uh, old ASP.NET and how we never did anything with just pure JavaScript and now you're gonna learn how to integrate ASP.NET or just do straight web development that you're used to seeing all of your cooler friends do. Um, and then finally, how do we all get along with that? That ties into it, so world peace. Hugs. <coughs> so first let's talk about JavaScript. Um, JavaScript often gets a bad rap, but most of y'all are in here because that's probably what you do most of the day. Uh, in the past, we've had uh, apps that, are we seeing, no, this thing doesn't, uh, tab very well, there we go. Um, so Wikipedia defines software as any set of machine readable instructions that directs a computer's processor to perform specific operations. Now in the past when we've developed ASP.NET websites, it's been very hokey the way we implement JavaScript. Um, sometimes you're just attaching things directly, in, we got, yeah, you've got that there, okay. Um, we've got, uh, just inline events attached to things, or we might include a script file at the, in the head tag or in the body of one of our pages. Um, but really, if you think about it, JavaScript has become kind of the de facto programming languages. I mean, more people use the web and interact with a mobile device or the internet than they do any other way. 80% uh, of the people in America have a smartphone, so they're all out there accessing webs, websites, web apps, um, so if you don't know JavaScript, you're getting left behind. Um, but traditionally, software developers look down upon JavaScript, and that's because it's been so ad hoc and by the seat of your pants and, uh, and all that crazy stuff. But I, I wanna just uh, point out a couple different things here. Um, I'm gonna use the touch screen because this keyboard's not working. Uh, so let's look at, this is what you, would, you might have done if you went through a traditional software programming course. Uh, here's just a simple C++ app, um, and here's the code file for it, and we can edit this in Notepad here. My first app, it's got some comments in it. It's got a ha uh, hashtag include to pull in some sort of external library, and then it's got an entry point into the application, in, in main, and then inside of that, it does something. It says, hello world. Standard, and if you know the syntax, it's telling to uh, send hello world to the standard C out, uh, which would typically go to the console app. So that's what traditional developers are used to. And here's a uh, simple web page. Um, and my question is, how is this any different from what we just looked at? Uh, so here we've got semantic markup, and it's machine instructions. Um, and we've got a script tag that tells it to pull in an external library. And then we've got an entry point in the body to start our application. In the C++ version, this might have been launched by a command window, um, which you could pass arguments to, and it would execute its, its main function. The same thing here, we're using the web browser as our command line window, um, and we can pass arguments to it through query strings or um, form variables. So it's not really different at all. Uh, the World Wide Web has hundreds of billions, who knows how many, uh, different variations of all of these little scripts that we're running. And we've, uh, we've got umpteen different browsers, umpteen different devices that all of these things are running on. So how do we get the most bang out of our buck across the entire ecosystem? So the best, okay, I decided I wasn't gonna do that. There we go. Um, first thing that comes along is Node. So got, Google has, uh, this Chrome JavaScript runtime, and it's built on top of C++, and so since it's C++, it can pretty much run on any machine. They've uh, made compilers for all the different ones um, out there, all the different OS's, and it's very lightweight, it's very efficient, it's very fast, um, 
But the fact that it runs across so many different platforms makes it very attractive because what it does is it takes JavaScript and compiles it and lets it run on all of those different platforms. So you're writing JavaScript, which is platform agnostic, and then you've got this build run tool that's platform agnostic. So now we've got something that can enable us to write software once and distribute it anywhere. Um, there's some uh, very verbose uh, technical jargon here. V8 implements ECMAScript, um, and it runs on mass Mac OS X 10.5, runs on Windows XP or newer, runs on Linux systems that are IA32 or 64 ARM processors. Uh, I think you can run it on Raspberry Pi, which is ARM processor. Um, so write your JavaScript once and get it anywhere. Now, traditionally with C++, when you write code and want to package it up, who knows where you're gonna distribute it to? And you've got these you know, binaries that are floating all around the web. And so package managers have arisen to distribute and publish all of these things so that other people can use them. Even within your own organization, you might have some sort of uh, distribution model. But we needed something that was similar to Node, runs anywhere, works with anything, um, and along comes Bower. So Bower is a package manager for the web. Um, websites are made, like it says right here, made from a lot of things. Uh, Bower works by installing, um, fetching packages from anywhere. So they maintain a repository that you can publish to or you can pull down from. Um, and in your JavaScript uh, program, you keep a file that tells you to what all of these packages you are. And then anytime you either, you can reload them every time you open the uh, software, um, or every time you build, every time you clean, go out and get the latest version so that you know that you're always working with a correct working copy. The DLLs might get busted. Um, you can tell it to upgrade or maintain versions as well. Um, and then it's also, since it's tied into Node, it, it's tied into all of these other applications that run on Node as well. So we're only gonna talk about a couple, but uh, Node can do anything that C++ can do to a machine. So there are plugins that can spin up a web server, can spin up a file system, um, stream music, all kinds of things. Um, and Bower uh, will allow us to deliver libraries that work with all of those things. <coughs> Uh, here is a Bowerbird. Um, I, I thought this was pretty cool. So th this is very similar to what we're doing with this package manager here. We're going out and finding all the little bits that we need to make a website. So our website is made up of images, sounds, video files, text resources, XML. Um, this bird goes out and picks up all these little things, come back and builds a nest. Something very beautiful um, and something very complex that couldn't have been built just from one uh, piece of uh, code. So the same thing for your website. You can't do the same thing on every different website. If you need some sort of variation, you need to go out and get all of these little pieces. So now that we have a way to manage um, all of our packages and pulling down dependencies into our software, now we need a way to build these things. So JavaScript, again, is working on every platform. We need something that's gonna be able to build this for every single platform. So along comes Gulp. And uh, Gulp is, at its simplest, just a build system, meaning you can use it to take all of the pieces that you have, automate tasks that act against those pieces, and spit out something that can be run in the Node runtime, the web, the web browser, or Node.js as a, as a server. <clears throat> um, the less work you have to do whenever you create these repetitive tasks, the better. Um, and Gulp allows you to create more JavaScript to automate all of these tasks and reuse them across all of your different projects, therefore making your job easier. Also, since it will work on any platform, um, anybody can pick up whatever machine and work with the same code that you wrote. Uh, you, know, you know, the less effort that you have, the better. Gulp by itself doesn't really do much, but just like uh, Grunt, there are thousands of plugins out there that do millions of different things. Uh, and Really, the only limitation on what those plugins can do is your imagination or the architect's imagination or some random kid off the street's gonna create the next you know, hot piece of software that we're all gonna be trying to program against or copy and emulate. <clears throat> and 
And since we can then take these Gulp plugins and reuse them across different platforms, we can also publish them to Bower and reuse them for other projects as well. So it's kind of like a, a whole big synergy thing, um, all kind of feeding into itself. <clears throat> So let's just take a kind of high level look at what Gulp does. Uh, it uses a stream object, and this is why Visual Studio team chose to use it. As opposed to Grunt, which uses a file system, and you might run into permission issues or disk issues, uh, Gulp uses memory streams so that you read the file in once, you pass it through the pipe, and it performs all of these different operations in the different sections of the pipe. And then when you get to the destination, it writes the file out once. So two I.O. operations means a lot less disk time, and everybody knows that memory is faster. Um, and you'll see here the, at the top of the pipe, we've got gulp.source. So the source defines where the stream is coming from. And with standard node file notation, you can uh, pass it in an array of files. You can pass it in a pointer to a directory and tell it to iterate through the whole structure recursively. Um, and it, it will take each of those files and then operate those uh, functions on them. <clears throat> the pipes then carry the data through the stream all the way in, and it operate all of the actions that you tell it into your, in your gulp file. And then desk just outputs the stream to wherever you tell it to in the end. Uh, so really it's just taking all of those raw materials that you got from Bower building them all up, spitting them out. Now we have something that's executable we can ship off somewhere and run in the node environment. So here's a sample, uh, sample file. I'm not gonna talk too much about what the different actions are because we're gonna come to that in a bit, but as you see, this looks like a standard JavaScript file. So gulp at the top of it, you tell it to pull in the gulp runtime, obviously, and pull in some libraries that we're gonna use to work on these files that we're gonna uh, manipulate. So it's gonna rename and uglify here, and then we're gonna specify a desk uh, that, to where we wanna actually write this file out to. So the first thing it does is says gulp task, and we're gonna define the default task, and then it's just a simple JavaScript function. So in this function, we're gonna return the gulp source of foo.js, and that could be, like I said, one file, an array of files, or a directory that you could tell it to pull all of the files from. And you can use wildcards to do whatever you would normally do in a, in a file system. Um, and then we're gonna pipe it to the first one, gulp desk destination, and that's gonna pipe it to that build slash folder. And what we're then gonna do is we're gonna take that and we're gonna uglify it, uh, which is gonna turn it into a minify, and then we're gonna rename it and put the little min on the, in between the file name and the JS. And then at the end, uh, we will write it back out to the file system. <coughs> So if you can take this process and go back to this pipe here, this slide here, and look at this pipe, if you just repeat those processes over and over and over, you can see how you could theoretically chain all of the different things that you would normally do in a build system together to, to create a very complex scenario um, that would uh, enable you to quickly manage your entire uh, development process. <clears throat> and then I thought this one was funny. Um, if you forget to minify your scripts, you're not gonna be able to fit through the pipes of the internets because your site's too big. Poor Mario, he just needs to lay off the pasta. <clears throat> and then, if you, here's another one. This one was topical because he's holding a big gulp. Um, and Captain America needs to go on a diet. But uh, no task is too big with gulp since it's running in the... Uh, since it's running in memory, you can take all of those files uh, and work with them a lot faster than if you were reliant on uh, IO, disk I.O. Um, and then I keep saying gulp streams, and I, this is not what we're talking about here. This is what Jay-Z flies around on, uh, not what we're trying to use. <clears throat> um, and so I keep saying that you know, Grunt is still fully supported. Uh, I was originally gonna talk about this, so the only difference in, in all of these slides would have been that instead of pipes, we would just have a successive series of hops where we're writing files out to the destination and then acting on them again, and then acting on them again, and then acting on them again, whereas Gulp actually leaves them in memory and doesn't uh, write it out until the very end. Um, Visual Studio, again, still has full support for Grunt and Gulp, uh, and 
there are a lot of plugins for Grunt that actually work a little bit better than, than Gulp. Um, specifically one that I'll show you when we get to the demo portion. But uh, it was hard for me to kind of take a different mindset for both of those things. <clears throat> so the next part, portion I wanted to talk to you about was workflow and teamwork. So task runners like Grunt and Gulp enable so many different actions on the file system that really anybody in your team can use these to make their job better and faster, and thereby reducing errors in the whole build process. It also gives a sense of ownership to everybody on the team, so if you know that if you check into one piece and then someone down the chain runs the build system on your files and it breaks something, then you can go back and uh, make them buy the donuts for the next standup. Um, but typically, in the workflow, you might have a designer who is creating some sort of image assets or SAS files, and there are grunt and gulp tasks that will take those files and convert them from a, an, a file system of images into a sprite file or take uh, SVGs and convert them into PNGs, um, take SVGs and convert them into a font, um, take all of your SAS files converted into CSS. Then we ship it off to the JavaScript uh, web developers and they start writing JavaScript code um, and creating HTML markup. And now they need to lint and minify all of that code uh, to make sure that they uh, were writing correct for the, for the next portion of the build because someone is gonna come back and unit test their code. Um, and then they also, once, they, once all of these unit tests pass uh, or if you're writing code for, or test first, test driven development, you know, you write unit tests first and we just swap these little things. Um, but we can then pass that on and uh, pass the build and then we're gonna version and deploy the application. So someone who is not necessarily a developer, maybe they're just the web admin, they can actually pull down your source, execute it on a build server that doesn't have all of the other libraries, so make sure that all of your dependencies are correct. <clears throat> so I don't know if these are actually correct, but uh, you can imagine these as the different people on your team. So all of the uh, designers, the developers, the people who are building all of the assets together, and then the testers work together to create software that can be deployed anywhere. <clears throat> so there are, like I said, there are thousands and thousands of tasks that you can use. Um, there have been people that have talked about other specific portions of testing and uh, some of the other, like the linting, checking code coverage, code quality. So I'm not gonna cover that, but I do wanna cover one that I think is pretty cool. Um, so in traditional video game uh, development, they used to use, well, they probably still do use, uh, sprites quite a bit. So you can also use this on your website as well. So if you have a lot of images and they're not very big um, and you just wanna create one resource so that you can cache it, reuse it over and over and over, they'll oftentimes take an image and place it into a sprite sheet. And based on the position, you can use CSS to actually target one of these little pieces and um, have one request to grab all of your images. So as you can imagine, you would probably create all of these and have it in some sort of uh, source control as individual files. Because if you need to change one, you don't want to have to go in and change the whole, fi whole file. It could be, uh, fairly large and then multiple people could be working on it. But Grunt, uh, Grunt and Gulp both have uh, tasks that you can write um, or reuse uh, to take all of your images um, and convert them into one sprite. So as you'll see here, we've got uh, Gulp task uh, sprites and what it does is that it takes the source of our source folder and looks for everything that's named star.png. So we filtered all of the files out of the folder and then we piped them to the sprite function which was uh, defined up above in our var sprite, our include file up at the top. And then we tell it to create some sort of a style uh, file, underscore sprite.scss, and place all of the CSS into the image folder and use the, the processor that we're gonna use as the SCSS. And then the pipe at the end is gonna write all of those files out for us. <clears throat> And then the next task below it, we're gonna create base64 versions of all of those files as well. Um, so all of the different packages that exist for Grunt and Gulp, all are required to document themselves as well. So when you pull them down, you can actually go out and see basic usage on all of them. 
and uh, pull them into your library very easily and, and rapidly get up to speed on it. <clears throat> the next one, so a lot of times you might run unit tests uh, in JavaScript in your actual browser, but if you want to tie them into your actual build, um, Gulp allows you to pull down a library for a headless browser. Uh, most people use PhantomJS. And then tie that into the command line so that you can actually spin up a, a web browser in memory, execute all of your JavaScript tests, and then tie that back to the uh, standard out so that you can gather if they, they succeeded or not. And if they fail, then you can create verbose errors, log them, ship them off, or you can pass it on so they can go to the next system, system of the build. And so this one actually used uh, Karma, but we, there's also one for Jasmine and Phantom as well. And uh, the basic usage you see there at the top, you just pull in the Gulp, Jasmine, Phantom library, and, uh, and then tell it for the default action that we're going to point it to our test file and pipe it to Jasmine, and that's it. So it's, since it's not actually writing any file, we don't have a dest uh, function on this one. <clears throat> So, like I said, there are a couple more, like uh, font creation, you can take the SVGs and output web fonts. Um, we can version all of our files and ship them off to development, QA, test environments, production. Um, we can pre-process our uh, less or SAS files. Um, we can run code metrics. Since we've got this tool here, um, Jasmine and Phantom, that run in a headless browser, we can actually check to see how much uh, coverage we have and create uh, very detailed reports on that, just like you're used to doing in C Sharp or uh, Java or C++. Um, we've also got obfuscation, minification, distribution, all of those other things. We can also then, since Node allows us to do anything like spin up a web server or work with the file system, we can actually do real integration testing. So we can deploy this to somewhere and actually spin up a website and write tests that way as well. Uh, things that are often very manual, you can actually automate those. <clears throat> so like I said, Node and uh, Grunt, Gulp, and Bower are very cross-platform. Um, in Windows, it's often been, we're kind of the, the, the red-headed stepchild uh, of the cutting edge web world, but Node now fully sports Windows. And Visual Studio in the last version also supported Node, but it's become, you had to install a bunch of extensions. Uh, it now ships with Node, Gulp, Grunt, Bower support directly in, in, uh, in the IDE. And along with Visual Studio and all of those great tools, you also get really awesome integration into TFS and Git um, and code testing and load testing. Um, you also have first class editors for pretty much every single file type. So I I've used all of these things over here on OSX, and I'm going to actually show you WebStorm. But, uh, you know, when you're on some of the other platforms, if they don't have something built in, you're downloading tools that might not be managed by someone with a lot of money. So you never know when the updates are going to come. Are they going to fix things that are broken? Uh, with Microsoft, at least, you know, you're going to get a tool that is continually updated, it might have their you know, own brand of things on it, but they've become very more open. So if you saw the build announcement this week, they've got .NET open source. The ASP.NET runtime, um, well, it's now called .NET uh, execution or something like that, I can't remember. Um, but I've already got Visual Studio on my Mac, and I can edit all of these JavaScript and HTML files there and interact with uh, the IntelliSense and um, all of the other packages right on, in both systems. Um, also, in OSX, we're often tied to going back to the terminal. So if you've done node development in Visual Studio 2013, you know that you still had to go back to the command line and do a lot of, the th a lot of these things. What I'm going to show you here in a couple minutes is how Visual Studio allows you to just edit some of the files and it will automatically do all of the heavy lifting for you. <clears throat> um, also, Visual Studio used to overwrite a lot of things that uh, made people working with you on other platforms very unhappy. Uh, they've changed a lot of ASP.NET, VNext, 
uh, and I'm not gonna cover all of those changes, but some of them are very breaking to the older versions. But these new versions allow you to work side by side with developers on other platforms without modifying any of their code. But you can still work with it in Visual Studio. <coughs> Um, and they've also released a free version that's got almost every single high-end feature that you're used to or wanting to use um, in the community editions. And the only two that you, the only two big ones that you don't really get are web load testing uh, that require a uh, professional or enterprise agreement. And then the other one is CodeLens. So CodeLens is in Visual Studio Professional. It's not in the community edition. Um, and that's probably one of the biggest uh, features that enterprise customers definitely are looking for. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to show you first, I'm going to show you the Visual Studio Super, Super IDE. Uh, and like I said, it's constantly evolving, so we haven't seen its final form yet. <clears throat> so now the real uh, test comes. So let's end. The dem end this and see what happens. The main problems I've had recently are that I'm running hotspot on my phone. I've got the Mac here. I've got a Surface. It gets super hot and uh, things start to uh, bog down. Anyways, so I'm running a VM here with Visual Studio. RC, so the latest and greatest edition. I, like I said, two days ago, I changed like 15, 20% of my slides. But this was the, the best part of it, was getting able to use this. So if we come over here and do a new project, first of all, if you'll see, let me, uh, OK. So. You know what, because I'm still in presenter mode, I bet. Yes, duplicate. <clears throat> Yay. <clears throat> All right, so now this is tiny. <clears throat> there we go. Uh, before we do that, Spin up an, or open up the new Visual Studio, and right here you'll see this Task Runner Explorer. No Task Runner configurations were found yet. These are the things that we're, we're about to look at. So before build, after build, clean, and project open. So if we come into Visual Studio and do a new project, and we say we want a new ASP.NET Web application, and click OK, what's going to happen? So it's going to use the templates that it already has predefined. And these are all of your old templates for ASP.NET 4.6. So you can still do all of that stuff if you want. But here's the ASP.NET 5 preview templates. So completely different. We've got an empty one, we've got a web API one, and we've got a website. So for the purposes of the demo, we're going to do a website because it's got some predefined stuff in it that we've already, that I want to use. <clears throat> And it's going to create the project, and it's going to create a lot of these initial files for me. And then we'll, we'll manually do it here in a second. <clears throat> so I'm going to change this to get, OK. Welcome to the ASP.NET preview. So if you haven't, whenever you do this, this, this page always pops up whenever you create a new project. And most of the times, you just close it, read all of these things. There's some really cool stuff in there. <clears throat> so under the web application, we've got this new first thing is we've got this new WW root folder. So this is where our web apps are going to live. And this is like a traditional web developer on any other platform. They, they take all of their source code, and they actually run all of these processes and tasks on them, and then they put it into a distribution folder. So you can think of the WW root as the, the distribution or web app folder that you're used to um, and all of those other things. And this is where all of our CSS, our images, and our JavaScript is going to live, as well as any static HTML files. And then it'll also hold the bin folder for any ASP.NET specific files as well. This folder is going to get um, wiped away on every clean. So it's, this is where it comes into, just like all of the other platforms, you're going to keep all of your code at the top level and then ship it uh, via gulp or grunt into the WW root folder. 
and run your application from there. So the first thing, let's talk about, so uh, Bower. So here we've got a Bower configuration file, and all it is is JSON. So if you're used to using JSON, which if you're writing JavaScript, you should be. Uh, this keeps a connection to the Bower repository, and with IntelliSense support, I can come here and specify any dependency that I want. And it will start from the very beginning, and as you type, it will autocomplete. So um, let's see, let's do Angular something. That seems very popular. So if we start typing Angular, we've got Angular 1.16, Bootstrap, no scope. We can pull in all of these libraries. Let's just pull in vanilla Angular. And then we've got the next piece which tells it which version do we want to use. So do we want to use the stable version? Do we want to use recent major version or the recent minor version? Let's just use the stable version. So now we've defined it in our JSON file. All of these libraries are going to get pulled into our uh, source folder once I save this. So if I ch come down here and change the output, to the package manager, oh, that's what we're on, and hit, hit, hit save, it's gonna go out to the github.com and grab Angular Bower and pull it down and put it into my solution. So where did it go? Uh, if we come over here and click on show all files, we've got this hidden Bower components folder. So what's in there? We've got Angular, and it, this is like uh, all of the stuff that's on their GitHub repository. So we've got another Bower JSON file, which describes what it's supposed to do whenever it's included into any project, and the package, um, Bower JSON again, and then all of the files that you're going to need. <clears throat> so we, you saw that that happened on save. We can also tie this to uh, project open, tell it to go and refresh all of my uh, dependencies every single time. Um, as you can imagine, once you get hundreds of dependencies, that can be time consuming, so you might only do it whenever you clean or do a build for test or QA or production. <clears throat> um, but that's really all you have to do for Bower. Uh, we can now pull in any component into our website or web application, and Bower will manage all that for us. So if you wanted to, you could go to uh, the command line and still do all of these things for you uh, manually, but it's just nice to let Visual Studio do it and use the IntelliSense, and you know you're not gonna add an extra S to something and, and cause a failure. <clears throat> so the next one we see here is config JSON, and this is what I was talking about where Visual Studio now sits side by side with uh, traditional web developers. Um, this config JSON file sits with, at the top level root with all of your other code, you can actually use this in your grunt gulp uh, tasks. So you can go in here and grab all of these things and change them. You can create a task to uh, convert your connection strings to XYZ environment or encrypt them or do all of those other things. <clears throat> so the next, next one is gulp. So this is, the, this is the one that we're really interested in. And Visual Studio creates this one by default. So at the top, we've got this comment here, binding clean. Uh, and then the first thing that we see is this uh, traditional um, require syntax to pull in all of the libraries that we're going to need in this file. So we've got uh, gulp, and then we've got rimraf, which is a, the clean. It used to be uh, gulp clean, and that's been deprecated, and now you're supposed to use rimraf. And then the last one is the file system uh, tools. And you can see here, the very first thing that happens is it says, read in my project JSON file um, and put it into var project. And it uses a little you know, handy function from uh, JavaScript to eval something into uh, that. And if you look in package JSON, we've got uh, the name, the version, dev dependencies. Actually, it said project JSON, sorry. Project JSON, this is the other big new one that's in ASP.NET v5. Um, this one's got, it defines where our WW root folder is, so you can change this if you're used to using something like dist or uh, app. Um, if you are writing uh, 
mobile apps for uh, Adobe PhoneGap. Um, but most people are used to using the WW root. And then all of these dependencies here can also then be changed through grunt and gulp tasks. Uh, we've got some specific commands that Visual Studio system uses to, to run these things. In the frameworks, here's your .NET execution. Um, and then you see these scripts down here. So post restore, it's gonna call those standard things that you're used to using with grunt and uh, for NPM install and Bower install. And then when we go to prepare it, it's gonna do gulp copy. <clears throat> so let's go back to the gulp file here. So after we load in that uh, file to grab the project name on it, we're creating a paths object here to our Bower components folder and our lib folder. So this is what we're gonna use for our, uh, dest, uh, our source and our dest files um, in, our, in our gulp tasks. So the first one says gulp task clean, and what it's gonna do is it's gonna, it's gonna do that gulp clean library, that RimRaf, um, and it's gonna wipe away everything that's in the WW root lib folder. So just the JavaScript portions. And if you wanted to, you could theoretically throw away all the CSS and image, images as well as all of the other things that are at the top level. Um, but the default one just reads out this folder. Then the next one is the copy. So it's gonna clean and then it's gonna also create this new uh, system here um, and it, this is manually configured. So this is one where I was talking about, it was very nice and grunt that I could just say, can you just grunt everything that's in my Bower file? Um, the gulp one does the th same thing as well. It just, it's not as clean, it's not as nice. Um, this gives you a little more control over what you're actually copying into your distribution folder. Um, but here we're taking, we're creating this Bower object that has each of the folders that we wanna create in our WW root and telling it what files to put in there. So this is the standard uh, files, file syntax where it's saying look in the bootstrap folder underneath dist and then underneath any folder that has star.js, map, CSS, all of those files, take all of those and put them in the bootstrap folder. And it's gonna maintain the hierarchy that they're in <coughs> in that uh, top level folder. Same thing for uh, Hammer.js, jQuery, jQuery validation, J and jQuery unobtrusive. And then at the very end, it takes all of these destination uh, directories that we defined in this Bower JSON object, and it says gulp, take all of those from the paths and concatenate that with our destination directory and pipe those there and uh, write them out to the destination directory. Um, if we wanted to in insert additional pipes in there, that's where we would do this, where we could minify, concatenate, uh, run uh, metrics on all of those things. Um, but then once we've created this file, we've now got tasks in our task runner explorer. So Visual Studio, you're used to you know, pointing and clicking for everything, um, especially if you do SharePoint. And uh, over here it lists all of the tasks that we have. So if we come here and we run, we can actually bind each of these tasks to before build, after build, clean, and project open. So Visual Studio will handle all that for you. But if you need to run it manually, we can just run it there and then you'll see a command uh, window open with all of the things that you can, uh, you can set the different uh, verbosity levels so that you can see if you wanna insert some debugging into your build system, you can. <clears throat> and now, if you look over here, our WW root folder has no, nothing in the lib. So our copy action actually takes all of those and puts them there. So now we're going to run this one. Happens really fast. And now our lib folder is back and has all of our libraries in it. So like I said, with the grunt version, it was a lot easier to do things. But now, well, let's get that uh, Angular code in there. Um, fairly simple. We're just going to create a new top level property here, and we're going to point it to Angular. This is why you never type in a demo.
see. Other way. All right, so now if I run this again, we should see an Angular folder show up. in our lib. Voila. Fairly easy. So for people who are used to uh, having things done for them, um, Grunt, is, like I said, it's more mature, has a lot better uh, libraries at this. Um, if you're addicted to writing code and you want to write more and more JSON and control very finitely all of the prod, uh, files that are included in your distribution folder, um, this simple little grunt task that's included in the default one uh, lets you uh, do that very manually. So we could go further and further and further down the, down the hole of what uh, grunt does in Visual Studio. Um, but I want to show you a couple other things real quick before we get there. Uh, so what I've done is I've created some non-traditional ASP.NET webs here. So I'm going to reopen Visual Studio. If I could click the correct thing. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to open a website that I've created. Called Star Trek Bauer Gulp Demo 1. So this one has none of the ASP.NET uh, crud in it. This is what, if I were to create a website for like a single page Angular app or uh, Backbone on my Mac, this is what I would be used to be seeing. So here's my top level folder. There's some Bower components, node modules in it. There's some Git attributes, Git ignore. Um, my Bower JSON file has some bootstrap, jQuery, all of those good things. My gulp file, it's the same one from before. Package JSON just has the dev dependencies for gulp and rimraf. Project JSON, I took all of that other stuff out because I don't really need it. I'm going to still use the web root because I'm going to actually use that in the gulp uh, task that I've defined. And then the solution folder. So there's all this stuff that we have on Visual Studio. So if I build this um, with the copy command, It'll do what we just saw in the other one, <clears throat> except on when you're working in a, in a website uh, in Visual Studio, it doesn't automatically refresh the folder, so you have to actually refresh it and look at it. Um, but there's all of our code. So that's Visual Studio. So what I did was I published that up to GitHub um, like I would in any uh, team environment, uh, you know, TFS or GitHub. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my Mac and show you what it looks like whenever we, we do it over there. <clears throat> uh, let's close this and then also pray that the uh, projector continues to work. And if anybody's cold, this thing could start a fire. <clears throat> Has anybody downloaded the new Visual Studio Code? Pretty sweet, right? Zero. We're there. Yes. OK. So yeah, I've got Visual Studio Code here. I don't. Is it just slow?
Now do you see it? Okay. No? No. Uh, try to do push for a mirror. How do you tell it to keep it? It should just automatically keep it. Re All right. So you can see it. Okay. So uh, Visual Studio Code on the Mac, um, it you know it's a very small file actually. You know Visual Studio takes hours to install. This took a couple minutes, uh, but we can come into here and get all of the uh, handy dandy stuff that we're used to. Um, and all of the IntelliSense that we're used to working in a Visual Studio environment. Anyways, that's not the one I want to show you. Uh, it's pretty sweet, though. Uh, so WebStorm, I don't pay for, so this is going to tell me that we're timed to 30 minutes, but we've only got like nine more, so. <clears throat> Here is a very simple uh, Bower and Gulp demo um, that I created and pulled across from the Visual Studio, and this one's a uh, not the same one. Uh, but if we look at the Bower folder, we've got all these same things here. And we've got this uh, gulp file here with uh, a task that takes, pulls in gulp, gulp clean, gulp cat, and all of those are specified in the package folder here. And so you'll see those show up in the node modules folder. And all of our Bower components show up in that folder. And then uh, WebStorm, or yeah, we're in WebStorm has the same kind of task runner here, all in Watcher. So let's go ahead and, and see what happens when we run all. We get the same command window, the same thing. It's done. It wrote out all of those files into uh, my WW root folder under lib. And what this, this one did actually took a, uh, I have some JavaScript models in this folder here. And in this task all, I told it to look in my WW root uh, lib folder and clean out everything, and then look in my models folder and look for these specific files, and then concatenate them, run JS hint against them, uglify them, and then rename them with an extension of min. And so that's what we got here. So if you look at the source here, we've got a, a JavaScript file that asks if this cat will scratch you, and that's true. Uh, and then an enum file that's got all of these different things here. But I secretly mapped all of them to yes, because cats are evil. And uh, they're going to scratch you no matter what. Um, and then there's a watcher file at the end that says, look at all these files. If I change them, then run this task all. <clears throat> um, but now if we look at the uh, file system, wow. So this one, um, we could pass this back and forth between Visual Studio and our Mac. Everybody in our team is happy. Everybody lives in harmony. Everybody hugs everybody at the end of the day, and you're, you're all good. Um, so like I said, we went down the, the vertical of, of ASP.NET uh, v5, what we can do with Grunt and Gulp, and how it can work on all of the different environments. You can take that topic and then expand it out a million times for all of the different things that you can do with Gulp. But uh, mostly, my point is, you know, Visual Studio is in a new era of cross-platform goodies that uh, everybody can use, and and it's a it's a great time to be alive in the Visual Studio world. But uh, that's all I have. So I will open myself up to questions, and if I don't know, I'll stand up here for a while here, or I'll be out at out of one of the, our booth at the table. Yeah. Yeah, he's asking if uh, Visual Studio shells it out to the command prompt. Yeah. Right. So that's why I was saying you would, uh, write all of your systems uh, integration tasks so that it would run on whatever computer was 
it was taken to. So you would theoretically write your code for the build, final the production build on that targets that kind of framework. Um, and if you need something that's local, you might leave out a dev task that wipes away all that stuff because you don't really need to rebuild all of those files all the time. But in the production environment, before you go, you might want to blow everything away, make sure every step passes so that you're confident in all of those things every single time. Anybody else? Yeah. So the question is, does it run in parallel? The pipes um, kind of look parallel, and they, they, they are async. So you can uh, ship them off and with uh, standard JavaScript async await. But it's, you're going to be tied to your processor. I'm not sure on the exact specifics on like limits and threads and x, y, z, but I can look that up and talk to you about it afterwards. OK? Yep. Anybody else? All righty. Well, thank you, guys. Yay, it all connected. <laughs>